Planet Steam. Martin, take it away. <coughs> Welcome, dear Imperialists. It is the year 2415. The Interplanetary Federation has done a great job in the last centuries. All necessary precautions have been taken to conquer this planet named Steam. The core of the planet consists of a 6,500 degrees Celsius hot source containing different resources, including water. It has taken over 100 years to complete the first block of 42 shafts from the surface to the core. There we go. All right. So I guess that is supposed to tell us the theme of the game. Right, so welcome to Planet Steam, here we are. All right, so what are you guys looking at? Well, the main board here is basically divided into roughly four, call it five areas, I guess. The first one over here, we have a tank zone map. It's a five by seven grid of zones with a river down the middle, as you can see. We have claim markers for each player, as well as neutral claim markers out on the board. Also, we have support airship mooring points on the right-hand side of each row, as you can see being pointed out there. Then there is the resource terminal and resource gauges part of the board. These are four tracks, one for each of the resources. They're numbered at the top, one to four. Those can be randomized in a variant we've chosen not. Again, we're just playing the base game here. The left side of each of those resource gauges is the price. The right side is the quantity available. Then moving up to the very top of the board, we have the local tank market, which is, we have the tank supply marker, and that's going to move for every local tank that is produced slash bought or whatnot, and the price is also shown up above it, up until it closes when there are no more available, as you can see there. Below that, we have the turn track, which is the timer of the game, and this starts based upon player count. So as you can see in a four-player game, it is covering the four-player. Now below that, I, this is why I said it's kind of divided into four or five spaces, because below that is the bonus resource box, but I'll be honest, we don't use that because it's real easy to overlook the resources that get put there because of the background on it, so we, instead we put it next to the specialist cards there whenever uh, we have bonus resources available. Now off board, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll talk about first over here, we have the tanks, converters, superchargers, and resources. So we have the base tanks and the things that can be added to them to produce various resources and or additional resources. So we have the base tanks here, and these are all, these are a finite amount that are available in the game. Then we have superchargers. These superchargers will plug into the top of the tanks, and those will produce one additional of whatever resource the tank produces. And then there are various other converters. We have energy converters, ore converters, and quartz converters as well. Now over on the left-hand side of the board, we have specialist cards. These are, think of them as characters that each player will bid for each round, and they're rule breakers for the round for that player that controls them. Then there are building license supply, and the number of available are determined by the number of player counts. The luxury quarter supply, same goes with that. Then we have the support airship, which actually has a little standee, but because top-down camera, we took it off, and the support airship will be moored on one of those spaces there. Then we have a die, so one blue six-sided die, as you can see there. And then off-camera, we have a bank. Now, the game does come with really good cardboard money, as you can see here. However, I don't want to be yelled at or made fun of by Martin, so <laughs> we're using poker chips. So there you go. Now, every player also has a player tableau as well. Now, what isn't on screen are these resource sheets or player aids here, which actually do a very good job of stepping you through each of the steps as well as the final uh, score calculation, as well as the resources needed to be able to do various things in the game. Then you, we have our starting carrier airships. There are These airships are basically holders for the various resources that are in the game. There is one for each type of resource, and it also shows what type of resource, but also the max amount of resources that that airship can hold, or in other words, that a player can have at any given time. All right. There are upgraded carrier airships. Well, upgraded means they have a higher carrying capacity. More on that later. 
Then every player has a set of claim markers in their player colors with a couple of them already out on the board. And the setup here is actually standardized based on player count. There is a variant in which you can go ahead and kind of draft that, but again, keeping it very vanilla for this playthrough. And everybody has their starting cash, which per player is a total of $120 to begin with based on player count again. And I should also point out that on the back of the rule book here has a handy dandy little setup guide for starting where the gauges start over here, where these start here, and starting resources and cash based on player count there. So that's, that's pretty handy as well. So that's everything that you guys actually are looking at, but how do you play the game? Well, Planet Steam is played over a series of rounds, and again, that's determined by the number of players. So in this case, we're actually going to play five rounds because the game ends when the marker actually moves onto that space. That is not a round in the game, so there's actually five rounds in a four-player game. After the last phase of one round ends, the next round begins and the game continues until we advance to there where we go into final scoring easy enough. The goal of the game is cash. So anytime that players are spending cash, you're actually spending victory points as well. As you acquire cash, you're gaining victory points, so on and so forth. So keep that in mind as the game goes along. Now, each game round players are going to, we're going to go through a series of phases. There are a total of four phases, same four phases in the same order each round. Those four phases are the expansion phase, the tank phase, the resource phase, and the end phase. And then rinse and repeat five times until the end of the game. Again, the goal of the game is money. We're going to be converting resources or acquiring resources, acquiring tanks. Let's start at the beginning. Acquiring tanks, putting them out where we have markers out here. Then we're going to try and produce resources to then convert resources into money based on the market over here to then gain more money so that we can win at the end of the game. That's kind of high level, big picture idea of what we're trying to do. So let's go through each step. So the first phase is the expansion phase. The first thing that we're going to be doing is placing bonus resources. So what does that mean? Well, there are four resources in the game. So what's going to happen is if there is at least one resource of a given type, we're going to lower that value one and we're going to place a bonus resource out there for each resource that we can. If it's at zero, you cannot do so. But remember, you do drop the available quantity of resources by one. And again, those would normally go up here, but it's really hard to see. Even when we're not streaming, we do this because it's too easy to forget that they're up there. Easy enough. Step two is we're going to auction the specialist cards. So there are four specialist cards. As you can see, they are numbered one, two, three, and four. Those are going to double both as rule breakers for that player, but also turn order for the remainder of that round with the number in the top right hand corner being the turn order as it goes. So whoever is the first player, which is random at the beginning of the game, subsequent turns it is whoever has Lady Steam, which is the previous first player. We're going to start an auction. You cannot pass if you were the first player. You must start the bid. A legal bid is whatever money you have in front of you. It's raise the bid or pass. Simple enough. We continue going round and round in clockwise order because remember we no longer have player order because we've returned all those cards over there. We go clockwise, highest bidder pays to the bank the amount they bid and they choose which of the four they wish to claim. Then from there, Oh, and in addition, I apologize, they also choose one of their bonus resources. So they take one of those available resources there. They can claim a resource in which they do not have the capacity in which to hold. If they do so, this is the only time in the game they will discard it back to the bank and the supply number will actually go back up. Otherwise, whenever you discard resources, the supply number does not change. Important minor point, but something I want to drive home, all right? 
And obviously the player that wins the auction and chooses their character, they no longer take part in the auction. However, it goes clockwise to the next player and we do the auction again with obviously whoever gets the last one getting it for free, all right? And claiming whatever resource, if any, are available. That is the auction of the specialist cards. Now, now would probably be a good time to go over what the four specialists do. So the first one, you're the first player. The second one is the venturer. Go ahead, Greg. All right. Auction an unclaimed zone or a neutral zone if there are no unclaimed zones. Uh, if you win, you only pay half. And we'll cover that when we get to that step over here for the auction zones. That's the venture. The third one is the airship captain. You place the support airship this round. Easy enough. So you get to choose where this is going to moor. And finally, the fourth one, Shrey, he has shorter arms. Go for it. Is the engineer. Immediately take a building license or 15 credits from the reserve. So immediately when you win that, you're going to take claim a building license if there are any available or... 15 bucks from the bank and add it to your stock. Okay, easy enough. Any questions about the auction for the nope. specialist? Nope. All right. So then we go into step three, which is auctioning a zone. So the venturer, whoever won, the second player, they choose any available empty space out here, as you can see out here on the board. And they, at that point, they say, hey, we're going to auction off, say, this zone here. And I'm just using this as an example, as a uh, marker there. At that point, Lady Steam, being the first player, begins the auction, just like how the auction went for the players for turn order. Cannot pass. Again, the auction works identical as it did. The highest bidder, whoever wins, will put their claim marker in that space. So if I won, I would claim it there like so, etc. All right? And only one zone is auctioned per turn, and that's it. So that's actually the venture is the actual next step after claiming all the, uh, auctioning off all the specialists. Then we move on to claiming a zone. Again, this begins with Lady Steam because this goes in player order. So we're, they're going to roll a die to claim any unclaimed zone if it's available. So if I had claimed, if I had won the auction for Lady Steam, I would then say, you know what, I want to go ahead and attempt to claim this zone here. I'm going to roll the die. If it's a four, five, or six, hey, congrats, I succeed. If I roll a one, two, or three, I place a claim marker on the closest unclaimed orthogonally adjacent space. So in the earlier example, let's say somebody, and whether it was me or Greg does not matter, let's say Greg had won the auction for the claim marker, and I try here, and I roll a one, two, or three. I fail at this one. So orthogonally adjacent, which is the closest one? Well, we look, obviously, not that direction, not that direction. So we have one, two away, and we have one, two away. So I can then claim one of those two spaces right there, of my choice because they are equidistant. If it had been something along the lines of that to where that's three and that's two, I would then claim that space instead. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. All right. If somehow, some way, I all of the, everything orthogonally adjacent has already has a claim and I still failed to get this, I get 15 bucks instead. Okay, but claim markers, they're bo both worth victory points or money at the end of the game, uh, six, one, half dozen, the other, but they also are going to come into play for where you're going to be able to place tanks where you have claim markers. So claim markers are going to be an important thing as we go along. So any questions about claiming a zone? Nope. We're going to do that in turn order and move on. So I suppose I should point out in lieu of rolling a die, you can always, if you have a building license, again, if you have claimed or purchased a building license previously, you can forego rolling the die and just say, okay, I don't want to take the 50-50 shot here. Instead, I'm just going to spend the building license out of the game and place one of my claim markers there instead as a guaranteed thing. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. Or you'll notice that there are these neutral markers out here. These can be replaced 
with a building license as well. So if for whatever reason I want this one or this one or so on and so forth, I just discard this out of the game. I put my marker in its place, but I spend the building license out of the game to do so. Okay, all right, easy enough. Moving on now, which is step five, place the support airship. So whoever is the uh, yep. airship captain chooses where this goes. So maybe they choose say like so. The reason that's going to matter is it's going to add to the production of any tank that is in that row there. Easy enough. All right. So that is the expansion phase. Any questions on that? Good, moving on. All right. The second phase is the tank phase. Now the tank phase is going to be where we're going to be acquiring these tanks either from the local market or it, as an imported tank. So step one is you have to pay the activation cost to do so, all right? So now would be actually a really good time for me to show you guys the player aid. All right, so here on the tank phase, you see it's a buy or pay the activation cost. The activation cost is going to be one water if you choose to do so. So if you have a water, you're going to pay one water, discard it back to the supply. If you choose to do so, you then can do any and all, any mix as many times as you want of these steps that you see there. If you choose or cannot pay the activation cost again, which is one water, you just forego the rest of the tank phase for your turn. Does that make sense? Okay, mm -hmm. so with that said, let's go ahead and go over in detail after assuming you've paid the activation cost and move on to the rest of that phase. So first and foremost, or it's called buy and reorganize. What does that mean? It's going to be, has to do with this stuff over here, buying tanks and accessorizing your tanks. So buying the tank. First off, let me bring your attention to the top of the board. So that is the local tank market. The number up above is the cost that the next ten, or uh, the next one is the cost of what the, I got that wrong. The cost is where the marker is. So f to be able to purchase a tank would cost me 11 credits or 11 bucks. That immediately will move over to the right when space. I can then buy another tank if I wish for another 11 bucks. I could buy another one for 13, so on and so forth, up until it moves all the way over to that last space in which the local market is closed, meaning even if there are tanks available, the market is closed, you cannot purchase any tanks. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. When you purchase a tank, it must immediately go onto one of your claim markers. So if I bought those two tanks, I have two claim markers. If I bought a third tank, that would seem foolish because I can't place it because I don't have enough claim markers, okay? All right, that's buying a tank. Moving on. We're gonna skip import, yeah, you know what, we won't. We'll go through importing a tank. So importing a tank now is going to cost a little bit differently. Now the advantages of importing a tank that you can see here is the cost is reduced, but it requires resources. So you can see here that it's going to cost $5 as opposed to the 11 to 22 that it may cost normally, but it's going to cost $5 and cost you two quarts from any of, or your airship if you have two quarts available. The other advantage of doing so is You'll, and in addition to that, it will also cost you one water. The advantage is if the local tank market is closed, you can still import a tank. So even if that marker were all the way down there, you can still acquire more tanks provided that you pay the cost to import it and you have obviously a marker to be able to place it out on the board, okay? All right, so moving on from importing tanks, buying a converter. These three are converters. A naked tank produces water, naturally. <laughs> okay, so there we go. So just a plain tank produces water. So these tanks out here will produce water. However, you can add on any of these three types of converters to now have it produce the other three types of resources. So you're going to pay the cost as shown, <clears throat> excuse me, so 
a to buy a converter I apologize the converters are shown over here so it costs two five or eight dollars respectively to buy one of the uh, converters depending on whether it's an energy in or or quartz and Martin is modeling here the various types so literally they're plastic pieces they plug in so that one there would be an energy converter and as it when it's out here on the board plugged in it now is an energy converter so it will produce energy instead of water then we have ore converters these look like little ray guns to me little gold ray guns when those are out there those will produce ore and finally we have quartz which are the same color as the quartz that's how i remember that <laughs> there we go and that's how they look when they're out there any questions about purchasing converters now if i wanted to place a the, i had this as an energy converter and i actually wanted my energy converter there as opposed to here and you can freely move those if you wish if I wanted to move the energy converter to a different area, you can do so, etc., etc. But if you don't have room for a converter and you want to purchase and replace it, if you have room, you can move the converter to a different tank of yours. If you don't, however, it goes back to the supply and you don't get anything for it. Superchargers, on the other hand, as you can see here, superchargers are pretty expensive. They cost the water, a ore, and two quarts. But those are real nice in a sense that, A, they look cool, they go on top of, there we go, of the tanks like so. Sometimes you'll struggle putting them on, others you will not. But what they do is they double the production, i.e. they add one more of whatever type of resource it's producing. So if it had, say, an ore converter on it, instead of it producing one ore, it will produce two ore later on. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. The next thing that you can do is purchase a carrier upgrade. Carrier upgrades cost one energy and one ore, as you can see here. And to do so, your carriers, three of which will start on the one value, they go up to four value or four size, if you will. They are not directly corresponding to the number of resources, but the number of resources go up. So one of these will start on their two side, but if the quartz one I chose not to start on my two side, two being that number in the top right hand corner, you can then pay that energy in order to then be able to upgrade the holding capacity of an airship. And these additional ones, as you can see here, can get very, very large. So the ore goes from the one side to the two side, goes up, then goes to the three side, and finally the four side, which can hold 14 ore. That can be really lucrative if you're going to then come over to the ore market to be able to sell it because maybe ore is scarce and worth a lot of money. But to do so, you pay the cost as shown on your player aid, and you can do that an unlimited number of times based up to the number of resources that you wish to spend. And lastly, the last thing you can do is rearrange tanks, converters, and superchargers, as I said, freely amongst all of your claims out there where you have tanks. Easy enough. Any questions about the tank phase? Nope. Okay, good. Then we go into the resource phase. Now, the resource phase is probably exactly what you think it will be, which is getting resources. So the first step is extracting resources. Again, this happens in turn order. I don't think it really matters. Everybody's going to do all of their uh, extractions. So what happens to do so? Extractions meaning they're going to get the resources as shown out here. So let's go ahead and let me do one more example here, there, I need a claim marker, there, that'll work, good enough, yeah, that'll work, okay, what's going to happen is you have to pay one energy for every tank that you want to expend energy or that you want to extract resources from. However, there are two exceptions for spending energy. If it has an energy converter on it, it doesn't take energy to make energy, it just makes energy. So this one would not cost me any energy and I would gain one energy, easy enough. Also, any tank that is in, any basic tank that is in the river zone, 
meaning it produces water, this is free as well. So it does not cost any energy in which to produce water. Why? Because there's a river. Makes sense, okay? However, for anything else that isn't those two exceptions, it does cost one energy. So in this case, it would cost me to extract all four resources, it would cost me two energy off of my card, like so, here, back to the supply for these two. I would then gain one water, two waters, three waters as a base, and one energy, so that energy would come back, okay? However, there are bonuses for doing so for adjacency, as well as for superchargers, as well as the support airship. Let's say the support airship were there. For groupings, like so here, okay, it's called a synergy effect. So if they're orthogonally adjacent and the same type, you gain one fewer bonus than the total number of tanks in that group. So that's a lot of words. Let's go through this. One, two, three water normally. There are three tanks in this group, so I would get two additional water out of that for a total of five water. I don't have any superchargers, which would add one more to whatever that was that produced, not the group, but that specific tank. And in addition to that, the airship conveys a plus one as well. So going back through this, we're producing one, two, three water as a base, one for the airship, which is four, and then there's a group of three, so it produces two additional for a total of six water and one energy. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that, is there any questions about that? Nope. So I would spend my two energy, as you see here, then I would gain one energy back for that one, and then I would gain six water. Well, you'll notice I only have a capacity of five. Anything above your holding capacity is wasted. Hashtag plan better. It does not adjust this market at all, only at the very beginning of the round when the bonus markers uh, come out or go back. Okay? Make sense? Yep. Yep. All right, good. Easy enough. We can move on. All the players are going to do this technically in turn order, but honestly, there really aren't a finite amount of resources uh, in the supply here because there are fives that are in the game, so we can do this simultaneously as it goes along. Then we go into buying and selling resources, which is going to be this area of the board over here. Again, starting with Lady Steam, the players are going to choose one thing to do, buy, sell, or pass on resource track number one. So player one is going to choose, are they going to buy, sell, or pass courts? Then it goes to player two, same thing, courts. Player three courts, player four courts. Then we go to the second track, which in this case is ore, as shown by this. Now, we do have some markers off board, which I said could be randomized. So it could be that it goes one, two, three, four, possibly. But again, in the base game, every player is going to do quartz, then every player is going to do ore, then every player is going to do water, then every player is going to do energy, okay? So buy, sell, or pass one player at a time. If they wish to buy resources, they're going to pay the amount shown for the amount of resources that they wish up to the maximum available. So in this case, if somebody wanted to buy, say, two quarts, they would pay $6 per quarts for a total of 12. They would take two from the supply and they would lower the quantity available by two. Easy enough, right? Help. Then the next player. We'll go to that. And uh, I'm sorry, then I apologize. Before they go to the next player, then we look over here at this chart, this one un, uh, naked uh, gauge, if you will. Wherever the marker is, will match the color and wh how what the movement will be on that track for the price. So it currently is at four, the price track will not move. But if perhaps, that player had bought four paying $24, we then would look here and the supply or the price would move up one before we move to the next player. The next player, whoever is player two, then would have the option of purchasing up to two 
or selling as many as they have up to whatever they have for seven dollars a piece then the market would adjust etc etc unless there are none available if there are none available obviously the next player or remaining players cannot purchase but they can sell does that make sense and if you pass mm -hmm. this will still happen even if you pass meaning let's say i'm player two so greg had bought whatever and he that was the final position here it becomes my turn we still do this so the price will go up for player three then it becomes player three if they pass we then do this again and then finally at player four they might wish to sell if they wish to sell here's how that works remove the resources from their airship back to the supply and then they get however much multiplied by the number of resources they sold then increase the supply let's say they sold four <laughs> there we go and then we would adjust the price based on this number which doesn't affect that easy enough any questions about that nope. we do that for each resource one at a time for each player going through one at a time okay then last and but not least of the resource phase is buying and selling certificates which are the building licenses and the luxury quarters again starting with lady steam then continuing in turn order you may do one of four things you may buy one building license you may sell one building license for how much you might be asking 15 bucks as shown on it or you may buy one luxury quarter a luxury quarter does nothing but it's worth 50 bucks at the end of the game so it's points okay or you may pass you might be asking yourself self what is the cost for building licenses and luxury quarters well the luxury quarters have a misprint on them and so I would recommend you use the player aid so let me show you here for a building license it's two water and one quartz however for a luxury quarter it is one quartz and one or it is not one quartz and one water to be clear player aids right follow the player aid okay and again building licenses can be used in lieu of rolling the die to claim these neutral places or specific places out here on the board okay any any questions nope you nope. good all right so buy one license sell one license buy a luxury quarter or pass and finally we move into the end phase it sounds ominous but really it's just the reset phase so here we go we're going to produce new tanks maybe i say maybe so maybe the marker is somewhere down here around the 20 if somebody can move the marker there we go so tanks are prohibitively expensive at this point now we're going to look at the ore and the energy markets if the quantity available is greater than zero of both of those and the local tank market is not already all the way bottomed out at their price down there at the end then move the local tank marker left by one for each available resource that you spend basically you're spending resources from the market to build tanks the game is to make it then available for players to purchase does that make sense yep so let me show you how this would work and we'll reset all these at the beginning of the game the ore and the energy let's take a look at those the ore is at nine available the energy is at 14. it costs one and one each for the game to manufacture one of those so it could manufacture up to nine of those so we would drop this all the way down to zero we would drop this down to six that would move over nine spaces there we go does that make sense yep yep okay however if either of these two tracks is at zero you cannot make it the game will not create any tanks however instead of that there's a nice little perk it moves up how many does it go up four four i believe yes yes it goes up four sorry <laughs> price forgot price. to write that down i apologize the price goes up four. right the price goes up four correct so there the scarcity of it exactly the left side goes up for the quantity doesn't automatically manufacture some of these it requires players to sell to the market does that make sense yep. okay mm -hmm. 
Then after that, we perform maintenance. What does that mean? We advance the turn marker one space. We turn all of our specialist cards back to where they go. We remove the support airship and we go to the next phase or the start of the next round. Continue doing that until the end of the game. Okay, the end of the game says, here we go. Cash on hand plus they, every player will sell their resources based on whatever the price is. They will get that from the bank. Then for any claim zone that doesn't have a tank on it, these are worth 25 bucks a piece. 25 bucks for each tank. So in other words, each place that has a tank on it is worth 50. Then it's 50 for each supercharger that a player has on a tank and 50 for every luxury quarter that they have on them. Light building licenses, carriers and converters aren't worth squat. Whoever has the most points wins. If still tie or if tied, everybody shares in a victory. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's how you play Planet Steam. Any questions? Nope. No, nope. I think we're nope. good. All right. And I will now. I'm all Vincent's making me paranoid in chat about whether which is right. I, I double checked it. The the player rate is correct. Okay. Good. Huh? Okay. I was right. Good. All right. So yeah, the <laughs> player rate. So these are wrong. Follow the player rate. There we go. So let's go ahead and reset the board, and I will figure out what that is. Did you guys see any questions in chat, or did I cover it all? I do have a question for us, though. Should we put these up or down based on the fact that the camera probably, really can't see? Probably down, I think. Sideways, um, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll lay them on their sides, so, and we'll try and, yeah, we'll try and, we'll do the best we can with that. Um, let me make sure that mine's right. It's one, two, three, and three. One, two, three, and three. That's good. These can go back. Ooh, oh, mm. this is why we can't have nice things. One, two, three, and three. <laughs> I have four. I have Sorry, it should be one, two, three, and three. Okay. okay. One, two, three, and three. I apologize. I may have looked at the wrong thing. Um, for the tracks out there, the prices should be the ones that are highlighted in red, and the quantities going left or right are six, nine, eight and 14 and we start with seven all seven building licenses and six luxury quarters which i know is correct Whew, there we go all right so that folks planet steam